And we're live, live from downtown Mill Bay. Okay. Lorelai? Hold it. Did you just did you just do this? <laughs> Who are you texting? Um, no, I need to know. <laughs> like, like I was on the phone this morning. The reason I was late because I was on the phone to the health center. So unless it's health or your parents directly. Okay, put away your laptops. Get out your uh, um, line of paper. We are starting a new section. We are going to start and end history today. Again, this is once again in support of my proposition that every subject is just chemistry. You learn history, so you learn the history of chemistry. Yeah. No. So, up until the end of last week. Yeah. And honestly, because I, I, I wasn't sure if we get to separation methods or not, I don't, e I don't think there's a separation method question on there. So, mostly the stuff previous to that. 500 BCE or before the common era, Democritus, who is Greek, said that things are made of tiny, uncuttable things. This was not, we, we pull him out and trot him out every time we talk about the history of um, chemistry. And, and it's just because he got lucky in, in retrospect. He just said that if you take something like a cake and you cut the cake, and you keep cutting it, at some point you get to the essence of cakeness and you can't cut it anymore. So it wasn't like he had he discovered elements as a concept. Um, he thought things were things. You could have the essence of a duck. And if you kept cutting a duck, eventually you get to the tiniest part of a duck that you couldn't cut and that would be cruel. Um, but things, whether it was you could take water dividing it in half and eventually you get down to the part of water that couldn't be cut in half or, um, or it was gold which is true because it is an element but it was the first time someone thought there's a there's a point at which everything stops so things are made of discrete units because there were lots of people who thought everything just went on for infinity um, in much the same way that some people think that time goes on for infinity you know if you keep can you always have a smaller fraction of time and the answer to that is no. There is a smallest unit of time called the Planck time. Um, that is the time required for that anything can happen in. And so there are the equivalent of atoms of time as well. Which leads to a philosophical problem. Is how do we actually get from one to the other? They don't actually know the answer to that yet. They just know what we do. Um, so this was what I called a wag. It's a, just a wild ass guess. It wasn't even really a hypothesis. He didn't do any testing. He just said stuff, and we pull him out. Now, if anybody has examples anywhere else, I pull him out because he will be in almost every textbook in BC uh, that you uh, um, have with that. But there may be some other ones in other areas, cultures, timelines that have also said similar things. I just don't know who they are, and I haven't seen a textbook that really has them. But if anybody knows of any, I would love to include them. And then Aristotle came along and just completely wrecked everything for a very long time. If we were studying philosophy, we would be like Aristotle's our, our person. He's the person that knows what's going on. But when it comes to science, he completely destroyed everything. Because he thought you could just think about things and get the answers without doing any experiments. So credited uh, uh, with partially with the invention of logic 
uh, um, and and mathematical concepts and in philosophy and in areas like math where we just invent it and it doesn't really exist that works really well but in areas of science where you have to do an experiment to see if it's true or not I mean you don't need to take two apples and add them to two apples to get four apples in fact if you take two apples and you put down another two apples and then you count five apples it still doesn't disprove that there are in fact two plus two equals four it still is regardless of the reality math is true regardless of what our universe says whereas science tests against the universe and changes its models but this idea that experimentation wasn't needed held on for a really long time Ooh, we can probably ask someone what are the four elements yes and air Did, do you know what the fifth element is what blood yeah oh well it could be actually different i mean if you watch the fifth element i think it was love uh, the movie uh, um and di and in some uh, cultures and areas they would say spirit depending um uh, the avatar what's the fifth element uh, the fifth element is the avatar um, but there was a real fifth element in this system as well uh, which i don't include up here uh, but they called it the ether and they actually held on to that even after they thought all the other ones were wrong and all the elements that were on the periodic table they kept ether because they couldn't explain how light could be a wave and not have a medium to go in because if you have an ocean wave and you take away the ocean do you still have a wave no so for light to have a wave it needs a medium to be a wave in and they called that the ether uh, and then Michelson Morley did an experiment and showed that there was no ether at all. Light was a wave in the absence of a medium. And then everybody got really excited. And so that this proved conclusively uh, the idea of an ether. So we had earth, water, air, and fire. They did good chemistry with this, by the way. Uh, we may mock them for, for not having enough elements. I mean, four is a little small. But they would take something like sulfur, and sulfur, they would say, has a lot of earth and fire properties. It's quite dry. Um, sulfur burns on its own. Uh, when you hear of fire and brimstone, brimstone is literally sulfur, and it burns on its own. So when they were talking about the concept of hell, and they said it's full of fire and brimstone, it's because it's basically a rock that can burn. Um, they would classify other elements as being air and fire, so like oxygen. Oxygen supports flames. And when they assign these attributes to various elements, they're really talking about the element's reactivity or the compound's reactivity, and they could make predictions that would kind of work. So they were, they were pretty clever. Now, like most things, it's wrong. But, I mean, what I'm, we're going to teach you about the Bohr model is technically wrong, but it works in vastly more areas than this does. So we're working towards better and better models. And we just use the model we need. The less of a complex model we need, the easier it is to use. And for a lot of applications, that's all, we, that's all you have to do. Then we came to the Middle Ages. How many of you have heard of the Dark Ages? Excellent. Why were they called dark? I have to call on a hand. And you, and you called out without. I've already asked you, but I haven't asked you. Yes. Oh, you just heard of it. Go. Because there's no improvement or development. And a lot of religion. And I want to say right here, since we're doing history, that view is completely wrong. They said that a lot in places but that was often because they didn't have much information about the in uh, this time period they were actually doing a lot of work yeah yeah 
they were just doing other things. And and a lot of the actual experimentation happened here. The alchemists. Uh, there was a um, alchemist who convinced the uh, the king that he should have uh, as you know the equivalent of the court wizard. Um, he should have everybody's urine. So he collected the horse urine. He collected the urine of all the people in the castle, uh, the guards, uh, and they and nobody went near where he was doing his experiments because it stunk because he was boiling it and boiling it and boiling it and boiling it. Well, eventually, well, he wanted to see what was in it. Just rough experimentation. He was eventually able to purify phosphorus, which is present in micro amounts in your urine. And phosphorus is something that once you ignite it, doesn't extinguish when you put it in water. So he was able to discover the eternal flame, which is one of the things he was looking for. So there's lots of like really good practical work um, that happened here. Not by very many people. I mean, if you're getting everybody's urine, first of all, nobody really wants to be around you. And two, there's not that many people who have time for this. Most people are farmers um, and not doing very, uh, don't really have time for much else. It's only been in the last very short part of history where most people aren't farmers. So we're getting a bit of experimentation and we're finally coming out of Aristotle. It took us a long time. You know. Next, I'm jumping hugely to John Dalton. John Dalton, um, probably made an impact because he did, he was really into doing lots of experiments. Now, as I said, it was hard for a lot of people to do experiments. At this time, if you had time and money to not work and not farm, and you were interested in science, so you have to have all the three of those things, you might have a lab. And you did experiments, but you didn't do that many. Because if you had those things, you were very wealthy. And you weren't used to hard work. You didn't have much of a work ethic. You just sat around and did the odd experiment and wrote about it. And John Dalton didn't ro grow up wealthy. He got his wealth later, so he had a lot of experience with working hard, and he really enjoyed it. And so he did a ton of experimentation and came up with the following uh, a set of principles. And here's where we really see uh, that an atom uh, pops out. And this stuck around for a long time. It is, in the last hundred years, uh, chemistry has changed a lot because we discovered the proton, the neutron, and the electron. Uh, Mr. Snow has a textbook that's a li just a little over a hundred years old. It belonged to a great grandfather. Have to check if that's a health thing. Nope. There is a smoke detector going off in Privet. We know. So he's, he's coming up with the concept of the atom. Oh, Mr. Snow's textbook. So it belonged to his great-grandfather. It doesn't mention the nucleus or electrons or any of this stuff. Um, it just it knows that there's atoms. It knows there's a periodic table. It identifies most of the elements. But it doesn't talk about electrons moving at all. And you can tell that they're very frustrated talking about it. Because they'll talk about how oxygen reacts. And it will even talk about how something must move between reactions but it has no idea what they are. Um, it's only the last hundred years that this has fundamentally changed. But we have the, the semblance of an atom right here. He, now, he didn't call them atoms. The terminology came later, but this is what he essentially said. Elements are made of really small stuff, which we now call atoms. The atoms of an element are the same, and different elements have different atoms.
So he's discovering the atom, but not protons, neutrons, and electrons, just that elements are made of the same thing. So the smallest particle of gold is gold, and every particle of gold is identical. And if you're a different element, you have different atoms. And then on top of that, <coughs> each compound is unique and consists of a certain combination of specific atoms in an exact way. This is all Dalton. He, like, essentially invented our concept of an atom. We give Bohr a lot of credit. Bohr just filled in the details that Dalton started. No. Okay. No. Um, but then again, when you say that, I'm like, well, maybe he could have, because they did a lot. So while you're writing that down, I'm going to write, how did John Dalton die? How did John Dalton die? I don't know. He, he died of old age of a stroke. You know how he said he was, uh, um, he, he grew up poor? He was known for being quite frugal. Apparently, that continued when his old age, when he was like rich and famous. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, he just, uh, instead of, you know, relaxing and retiring, he became a teacher and just taught students until he died. Aw. I think he's my new personal hero. I didn't know that detail before. Yeah, so apparently here I got ty tired of typing. <coughs> Chemical reactions reshuffle the original atoms into a new combination. So, with this, he was able to do actual chemical reactions. He could say, look, I've got an element. Every part of that element cannot be, is the same as every other part of that element. If I react it with another element, I get specific combinations. Every time I react sodium with sulfur, I get N two parts sodium to one part sulfur. That's all I get. If I react two things together, uh, let's say we just reshuffle the atoms. So it becomes and then of course balancing comes in. But at this <coughs> point He's got a word. Now, he didn't use this. He came up with really uh, um, his own unique shorthand. So, like, different elements would have different symbols, and he used little circles um, to show that this is that atom and that is. So, he also introduced the idea that atoms are just little tiny balls, and he would move them around, and he would show you uh, um, how the reactions happened. Uh, Dalton, chemistry writing. See if I can come up with a quick... Yeah. There we go. Sorry? No. I want you to write them. So he's doing things like this where these are his symbols for the elements, and then he's combining them in various ways, show how that shows how they bond. Uh, um, 
and shows how they uh, move around. So these are the, his elements he's discovered. Uh, these are how they combine in a variety of different ways. And uh, I think, I don't remember, I think that one might be ammonia, NH3. Um, and so he's, he's doing what we would recognize as chemistry. No longer making wild ass guesses, but backed by a lot of experimentation. Sophia, why is your computer open? Why is your computer open? Oh, just put it away. Mm. Now, at the same time, uh, we're as we're doing history, uh, um, they're coming up with, uh, uh, this leads into, Dalton led directly into the law of conservation of mass. If everything is just a rearrangement, then nothing's being lost. That same sodium atom that you have in your table salt that you have now is the same sodium atom that was present five billion years ago. Things just get recycled. Yes. Um, this, at the time, at the time they thought spontaneous creation was a thing. So, for example, at the same time John Dalton is doing this, in biology, um, they thought that flies appeared out of feces just by spontaneous creation. Because they didn't know that maggots and flies were the same thing. And they didn't know the flies were laying eggs because they couldn't see them. Microscopes weren't good enough yet. And so they thought, like, things could just appear. And so this idea that things can't appear was was huge. Now, how did our universe uh, uh, get created is an entirely separate question. We have some guesses. I mean, we know that there was a Big Bang. Um, and we know that we're creating matter, not we, but the universe is creating matter all around us all the time. Uh, it's called the Casimir uh, effect. If you take two really, really thin sheets and put them next to each other, uh, and, the, and Mr. Casimir won a Nobel Prize for showing this, because um, there was a theory at the time, if you take like a vacuum, like a hard vacuum of space, there's absolutely nothing in it. He, with this, he can prove that there are things being created. He can get particles out of it, even though there's no particles there. It turns out in space, when there's nothing, every microsecond, something's being created. But it's, it's matter version and it's antimatter version are being created at the same time. So the positive and the negative. Now, before we had nothing, what is plus one, plus minus one? Yeah, we still have nothing overall, but that's because we divided the nothing into two somethings that cancel each other out. Right. And then in, and as soon as this is created, which is, happens in vacuums, they annihilate each other and go back to zero. And now, that's happening not just in a vacuum. That's happening everywhere. But in a vacuum, and if you put two plates, occasionally you will get the particle and its antiparticle created on opposite sides. And those plates are charged in a way that, uh, that this one will take off and they'll detect that one. So he was able to detect that force that was predicted, oh, quite a while ago. Yeah. So when we talk about uh, um, the origins of the universe, uh, we're like, well, we know we can get something from nothing. So maybe the Big Bang is something like this, but on a larger scale. There is a question of the asymmetry, because when the Big Bang happened, it happened with a lot of force. So a lot of something was created, and a lot of the other something was created, and they really did annihilate each other and sort of blow everything up. But why do we still have stuff? Why wasn't it perfect and cancel everything out? So the asymmetry is still explained. We don't know that. But we do have a mechanism that physicists look at to say, well, the universe being created is a little similar to this Casimir effect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, bunch. Excellent. Well, we don't know why it happened, like like what precipitated it, and and it's impossible to talk about because there was no before, because time itself started to exist at the start of the Big Bang. 
So there's no before to talk about. You can't say, well, what were we doing beforehand? Like, what was the universe doing? The answer is, well, there was no before. So that's a silly question. Yeah. It's like asking, like, where are the corners on a, on a circle? Like, there, there aren't any. It's just a silly question. Yeah. And if you were able to move fast enough, so it would require faster than the speed of light, in a straight direction in any part of our universe, and you just maintained that, eventually you would end up back where you started. Our universe is unbounded, even though it has a volume. So, no matter which direction you go, long enough, you'd end up back where you started. Yeah, at least that's what our models show currently for our modern understanding of the universe. Okay. Some overall models. How many of you have eaten a plum pudding? One person. It's disgusting. Uh, it was apparently a very popular Christmas treat uh, uh, in, in um, the English tradition, I think. And Thompson was English. Um, in case any of you have never seen a plum pudding, we haven't changed the name of the model. If you look in any textbook, it'll say, we're going to talk about the plum pudding model. This is a plum pudding. It's a big cake with plum stuck in it. I did see a textbook that tried to like shake it up and it talked about the chocolate chip cookie model, which works, but that's not the name of the model. And so every other textbook will still talk about the plum pudding model. So rather than saying chocolate chip cookie model, which works, you're going to see plum pudding model anyway, so you might as well just know what a plum pudding looks like. So what Thompson said is that this atom that Dalton invented isn't composed of just one thing. By this time, we know that there's positive and negative things. Because at this time, they know that negative things can be broken off of the atom. So they know that electrons exist. They don't know their mass. They don't know how big they are. But they know that they can occasionally break them off. So he's like, it's the big ball of dough. And the electrons are just stuck inside of it like plums in a pudding. Yep, so the, the entire ball is a big ball of pl positive charge. So this whole thing is positive. But all of the electron um, all of the electrons are negative. I'm standing just while I'm putting that in, and then I'll go this way. There we go. Pardon? And then the embedded bits are embedded bits of negative charge. So, how long did that take us? 1808, 1897. So about 90 years. Science is moving a little faster. I mean, we essentially went from Democritus, 1400 or whatever number of years later, and probably more like 1600, 400 and they're doing experimentation Dalton comes along so yeah something like 2,000 years later we got Dalton and then 90 years later we're starting to see what's inside this we got some negative things we got some positive things okay. good if anybody's not good let me know Then Marie Curie. Are you 
Oh, she did. She, uh, they didn't know how bad radiation poisoning was. Um, in fact, we didn't know for a little while. Oh, sorry. Oh, hold it. Because when I, when I move on, if it's too fast, like, hold me up. Okay. Bacquerel uh, found out that uranium radiates energy. So that's how he came up with the term radioactivity. It was supposed to refer to the radiation, not to radio. Yes. Oh, don't care anymore. It's like, it's like 1900s now. We're starting to move quicker. Oh, am I going to expect you to remember all the dates? No, this isn't history class. Don't know, don't care. Um, the order, just so that you see how the models developed over time, is useful in this understanding the modern model, because every model was kind of true and worked in a variety of different uh, experiments. I do like talking about Marie Curie because she shared the Nobel Prize with her husband, Pierre. Hands, hands, hands. Yes, question. We don't. We, it is half true. We know it's only half true. Um, but it's not really like it's half true. Um, it's more like this. And I'm going to go on a little aside here and probably annoy some people if I put my head right in the way. So I'll go over here. But let's say we're taking some measurements. And a thousand years ago, that was our measurement. So our competing ideas, you know, that's one theory. Um, this is another theory as to what that looks like. A thousand years go by, we take some more measurements. And that's our new data. So now people are theorizing, well, it looks like this. And other people are saying, like, mm, I think it looks like this. And then we go on, and they work for a variety of things. And we do take some more measurements. And now we get and they go, oh, now we really know what's going on. It is definitely a version. Oh, I didn't do that in red. It's definitely a version of this. And now here we are. You're like, you know, we know everything. Where in actual fact, and then quantum comes along, it turns out that the actual underlying reality is something like this. And eventually we'll get there because we'll start adding data. And we'll start getting closer. But will, will, will we ever know the exact shape? No, our model will just get better and better and better. We have pretty good models nowadays that can predict a lot of things. The only reason we have these models is to make these predictions. And then we can use them. Um, science is quite open about the fact that we don't actually know the truth. Which is really frustrating. Because when they get, especially early on in the days where people were talking about climate change and global warming, they get scientists on and they're like, are you 100% sure? And they'd be like, no, because they're not a scientist. Scientists are never 100% sure. But are they 100% sure the way that we commonly use the word 100% sure? Yeah, because if you say, you know, I'm going to the store and they say, are you going to get in a car accident? And you say, no, are you 100% sure? Yeah, I'm a safe driver, it's fine. Um, but you're not 100%, like it still could happen. Scientists are trained to include the error in their observation. So yeah, uh, if you're, our, our truth is useful, but we know it's not 100%. Hold it, what areas do you know things 100%? Because there are some areas of human knowledge that we, math, because we made, so it's all the stuff we just made up. The rules of grammar, because we just like invented that. So anything that you just imagine, 100%. Anything we actually have to find out will never be 100%. Although, sorry, what? Curie? The Curies? Yeah, they discovered radioactive decay. Oh, you have not heard of Marie Curie. I'm using it like common knowledge, but um, she, she uh, found out about radiation, did a lot of work with radon. Uh, she eventually died of cancer. Um, does anybody know why her husband got the Nobel Prize with her? What did he discover? 
They all work together. Turns out Marie Curie was the brilliant scientist, and her husband was a really good lab tech, like like a good, a fine lab technician. But they couldn't award an, a, a, a Nobel Prize to a, just a woman. So they included her husband, because obviously he must have contributed, even though all the work bears is her. Yes. The electron microscope, yeah? Oh, yeah, we can now take pictures of atoms. We've In the last little while, we can actually see what, 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 what their electron cloud looks like. Yeah, especially some really big atoms like gold and stuff. So, like, I think IBM did it first. They took gold atoms and they made the symbols IBM and then took a picture, and now we can start looking at uh, um, shapes and, and, yeah. Yeah? Oh. Yeah. But the rules I meant made up are things that we made up. So, like, the rules of monopoly can be 100% known, even though nobody follows them. But the rules of economics aren't something we made up. They're an emergent process that happened when we engaged in an economy. They're not something that we, we try to control it, but they're just things that happen. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, these are just little subjects because I'm only going to spend one day on history because I refuse to spend any more time because I want you to know the history of models, but we don't need to go into the details of the history. Uh, does anybody know what alpha, beta, and gamma radiation are? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you're, yeah, you're jumping right ahead to the Rutherford experiment. Yeah. Yeah, the gold foil experiment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show that right next. Um, if you don't know, alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Uh, alpha is helium particles, and we're going to see them next. So it's literally a chunk with two protons and two electrons, and you rip away the electrons so it's charged, and you have alpha radiation. Uh, that will absolutely give you cancer, uh, but it doesn't penetrate you very far. So, like, if you get it on you, it gives you cancer there. If you eat it, it gives you cancer all through your intestines. So, like, it's a really nasty form. Um, but you can shield against it relatively easily. You just got to wash it all off. Uh, beta is a fast-moving electron. It can penetrate a fair distance. Um, it can still be stopped. Like if you have like aluminum foil, it'll absolutely stop uh, um, beta radiation. Uh, um, your skin will stop alpha. I mean, you might get a bit of skin cancer, but uh, your skin will stop from pe penetrating. Um, you'll, uh, beta will penetrate into your flesh a little ways. Tin foil will stop it completely. Gamma is a form of light, high, high energy light. And so it goes right through you and can give you cancer in any part of your body because it can react with any part of your body. Um, it's not dangerous in the sense that uh, um, it's not, if it's in your body, a lot of it will escape because it actually shoots right out of you without interacting. Unlike uh, alpha, which is slow moving, stopped by everything, so your body absorbs every piece of it if you actually swallowed like an alpha emitter. So Rutherford found all these particles and then used them for some experiments. And I'm going to show you the gold foil experiment. Let's go. So he's got a radioactive source in here, and he's uh, um, emitting some alpha particles. Alpha particles are positively charged. They're helium, so they got two protons and, and two neutrons. So they're, they're an actual molecule. He's got directionality to it, so they're only coming out one way. And this thing is a detector. So everything they hit lights up. When there's nothing in the way, they'll light up here. And this really is what showed us that things like the uh, um, plum pudding model are wrong. Gold is incredibly malleable. As a metal, you can pound it until it's only a few atoms thick. 
So he's got a very thin gold sheet. It's only a couple atoms thick, and he's firing alpha particles. And weirdly, well, I'll go through it. Don't even stop. And a few of them bounce straight back. And so what's going on is we start seeing the electrons. Most of an atom is empty space. So as long as they can move through and the nuclei don't hit each other, they just fire on through. But if a nucleus hits a nucleus, they bounce sideways, and sometimes if they hit it dead on, they bounce almost straight back. And so now that tells us that, well, whatever these things are, they aren't a plum pudding because they're not one big solid mass. They're mostly empty space with a hard center. So now he's really getting into what the structure of the um, atom must look like. And the gold foil experiment is the experiment that, that really showed that. Okay, I don't know why that one just went straight through. That should have bounced off, but there we go. Nucleus with nucleus. So the Rutherford experiment which I do want you to write down just roughly. Uh, we've got an alpha source. The stuff that goes through shows that the atom is mostly made of empty space, but the stuff that bounces back shows us that it has a hard nucleus. And this was a key experiment in understanding the model of the atom. Question, Samantha? <laughs> Bounce back. You can't read my writing? How dare you? Um, mm, yeah. And I was going to, uh, I want to unlink. No, no, unlink. Ungroup. Group. Ungroup. Tag it. Go like that. Group. Oh, coughing. Uh, he, they thought either the entire thing's like soft, like a pudding. Like a real, what I, when I originally heard the um, plum pudding bottle, I env envisioned like a giant like vanilla pudding with plums in it because that's what I thought a pudding was. So they thought either they would mushy. Who asked the question, by the way? There. They thought it was mushy, and so either everything would go right through or they were hard and everything would bounce back. So with the experiment, because it did both, it gave them idea of the structure. It must have had partial areas that were that were um, loosey-goosey and you could go right through and really hard centers that they could then bounce off of. So they're expecting one or the other, not both. Does that make sense? There and there. Had hit. If the computer can recognize uh, um, my writing. Oh dear, it didn't. So you are correct. Oh, hold it. Why did it control? <laughs> group. That's why I didn't recognize it. It didn't group it together. Yeah, that's the reason. There we go. Nope, still didn't. Fair enough. So, since it bounced back, it had hit a dense center. So, uh, this is what Rutherford discovered about the atom. You could call it the Rutherford model. If someone said the Rutherford model, this is exactly what you would, they would say. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah, it just glowed. It's, it was essentially an early form of a TV. So, like, old TVs had an electron gun in them. I don't, have you ever seen TVs and they're like this big and they're not a flat screen? Yeah, that's known as a cathode ray tube. And cathode is an old word for electron. 
So you put an electron gun and you fire it at a phosphorus film and when it hits the phosphorus it glows. You just have to do it in a vacuum. So that was in a vacuum and he had phosphorus covering it around and you could just literally watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Alpha? Oh, okay. No worries. Yes? Because it's dense. It's got a big nucleus. So you don't need as much of it. It's just it's cheap to use. Like you could use other... Um, but, you know, it's it, you can make... It's a metal. So we can form it into stuff by melting it and pounding it. Uh, whereas bismuth is a lot more brittle. So it's not as practical to use even though it's denser. Um, and, and so if we use aluminum foil, you just need a larger brick because aluminum's a lighter, doesn't have as thick a nu nucleus. Yeah. Now, this didn't tell us about neutrons. Chadwick discovered them, or he predicted them, and then they were later discovered. And I include that solely so I can say, because he was an absolute Chad. So this is my thumbnail sketch of the history of the atom. Very, very quick. And sort of see how uh, the history of understanding and experimentation, whoops. Changed what we knew. Oh, it, yeah. Oh, the Rutherford experiment. Excellent. I used to have something in BC like that. I don't think they do anymore because they don't want to give them money, and they're, and they, and they're. I don't, I'm not sure, but it seems like when they started doing the competencies as well, they're trying to get away from saying that some people do better than other people, so like honor things aren't existing anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, there used to be a standard one in BC, like in grade ten. If you did, if you got an A in gr in in grade ten, you got like an extra, just like a hundred and fifty dollars scholarship to like buy a couple textbooks at university. Like everybody in BC got it, just to encourage good grades. And then a few, a number of years ago, they just sort of quietly got rid of that. And there used to be more at high schools too. Ah, nice. Mm. Very generous person. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you the thumbnail sketch of the thumbnail sketch. So, in the interest of, is everybody done with this page? Am I not done is the better question. Am I not done? Okay. So, in the interest of watching our models improve over time, let's go with, so we've got here, solid sphere and that's Dalton you are writing this down and it will be very quick solid sphere Dalton 1803 mm. no Dalton was the one that did all the little diagrams and was after Aristotle so next one Plum pudding. Thompson. 1897. And that is almost the same. Except now. We have little. Negative electrons embedded in. To a positive dough. That's the plum pudding model. Mm. And then, I'm doing a timeline. I can't, ooh, why am I drawing? I have tools. Somewhere in here I have tools, where are they? There. 
And nope. Nope. Shape pen. Where's the shape? Shape right here. I could do this. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to do these in advance because I have the shape recognition pen. And then we have, oops, shape recognition pen. There we go. It is short. You could do it vertically. Yeah. Um, if you have, for example, the Bohr model with energy levels, um, allows you to predict how many electrons are going to come on, on and off. So you, that you can use that to predict its reactivity and uh, how many other elements it can join with. If you don't have, if you just are back to the solid models, you, you can't do that. If you've added in a bit more, so the second one here, you have some electrons there, you know what it is that has to transfer back and forth. That's going to improve your understanding of the atom, which is going to improve how you think they're going to bond with other things and what's going on when they bond. Um, I mean, with Rutherford and Bohr, um, that information allowed them to split it and build nuclear weapons. So they were able to, with a little bit of understanding, all of a sudden they were doing lots of stuff. Um, when we get into quantum and we start looking at a little bit beyond Bohr, that allows us to predict the shapes of atoms and a lot of uh, reactivity that you would take in university, like how are these models are going to act, are going to talk about how these shapes bend and join. And then you can predict reactions you're trying to do. Let's say you want to invent a new, you've got a new type of drug. You have got to join this with that. It allows you to predict what type of reactions you should try in order to get them to bond. Yes. Oh, I, I'm not done. So I just quickly drew these because I had the shape one. This is going to be the Bohr model, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is going to be the Bohr model. Put it right in the center here. But we've got the nuclear model. This is with Rutherford. And that is in 1911. So someone who wanted dates. And in this model, and I haven't drawn it yet, we do have a... Actually, no, that was Bohr. In fact, you're going to love this. I'm going to delete that. Yep. And I'm going to infinite clone. I'm going to clone this one. Because if you've seen models of atoms that look like this, oh, just scribble it out and write a new one. It's fine in which you have ovals and the electrons are moving like this. So they're not in different levels, but they're just spinning around it. That's the nuclear model. Electrons spinning around uh, a central shell, the nucleus is in here, and all the positive charges in here. Bohr said, ah, same thing, but the electrons come in layers. And then we came up with quantum. Bohr model is 1913. Look how short that happened in. Yeah, Bohr. And this is known as the planetary or just the Bohr model. And then we just get to quantum. Yeah. Yep. And in this one, the electrons are not actually physically present. They're just there as a probability. So every dot is where the electron might be. Yeah, it's the cat guy. Pardon? Planetary model. 
Yeah, model. There, see? Recognizable. Electron cloud. And we're going to do quantum this year, so we're going to talk more about uh, um, electron cloud. Oh, no, it's fun. Yeah. Quantum, Schrodinger. It's a person's name. You can see 1926. No. I mean, if a computer can do it. Are you saying you're not as good as a computer? Oh. <laughs> You were computers aren't very good. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. And and what what we have here is in both of them is we have a nucleus. And it's being called the nucleus, and we have in the nucleus we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Mm. Yep. Oh, there's subatomic particles that, there are sub subatomic particles like leptons and stuff that are inside these things. Um, that goes that goes past quantum, but quantum is still the the model of the atom, and it even governs those things. Yeah. Okay. I do have a little thing. Sorry. Not everybody saw this. Now, you can pick any one of these. I'm going to recommend the Bohr because I feel you probably know it the best, having done it in grades 9 and 10. But have you heard of the thing explainer? No. It's it, it, you, feel, you feel it. It, it, it turns out it, it's really not going to. Um, yeah, it should. Um, this, this is... Uh, um, from a book that uh, XKCD, uh, that writer of that wrote, uh, called the uh, um, Thing Explainer, and the cover of it is where he talks about Upgoer Five, and he explains Upgoer Five in the ten ten or the ten hundred most common words, because of the ten hundred most common English words, the word a thousand does not appear. So he didn't. He explained t difficult scientific concepts using only the most common thousand words in the English language. So, you can't say the Saturn V rocket. He called it the Upgoer V because he had to get it down to a level where you would explain it to someone who only knew the most common words in the English language. You have to do that about a model. So, like, so for example, if you were to explain the, um, the Bohr model to someone, how would you explain the nucleus? A center inside of an atom. I used uh, a couple. The word center inside an Inside of an uh, okay, what can we add? A ball inside of a middle. I, I heard, and that seemed brilliant. We got a ball inside of a middle. 
<laughs> we have a, a circle. So I'm going to here on the on the on the page. I've got I've, if you want to take a look at the words, I have a link. I don't want it to be over a hundred words. This is intended to be short because I want your understanding of the model. But I know if I say describe the history of the Bohr model, it's really easy to look on Wikipedia and just rearrange those words. And I don't know if you know what all the words mean. But if you can explain it in those words, you have to know what they mean because you translated them to something else. This is going to be homework. Okay, I am going to put it. R it's not up on Google Classroom yet, but it's going to go up in a second because I have to press the button. Question. It can be a model of choosing. I recommend the Bohr model because I'm sure it's the most. But if you're like, I totally want to like describe Rutherford. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You missed the whole thing where we like described a nucleus. What was the nucleus again? There you go. What the heck? We have a quiz on Wednesday, so I'll probably make it due on Friday. Um, classroom. I only want 100 words, and I don't want you to spend time on it. I, d I don't, wa don't want you to spend time on it. No, no, no. I don't want you to s worry about it for a whole week. It's less than 100 words. This is like, this describe the Bohr model as as accurately as you can. So you're going to want a nucleus and electrons and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can't come up with the same answer. No, I want your explanation. Uh, you can pick a different model. Yeah. It just, the model you describe has to have some substance to it. So if you give me, I say under 100 words, and you give me like five words, and you just describe a solid sphere, that's, that's I, I mean, I'm not going to say extending for that, for example. <laughs> Sphere is definitely not part of the most common words. <laughs> Pardon? Everything's for a grade. Because you're always learning. So I, I take things for grades. Sometimes I may not take things for grades. Your pre-lab, I didn't, I gave you a feedback, but it, it, I, it was a, a formative assessment. Yeah. You're welcome. I weep. I weep. Oh, well done. How can we not miss seeing Wednesday? Yay. Yay. Well done. Thank you. You may leave your backpack there. Hold it. No. Is our class next or last? I thought it was last block. What class was this? E? Aren't we D block? So it would go EFD. Yeah, that goes to one. Hold it. What? There you go. So that's us right now. Now you have a different class. Is it? If you have any German links, 
like I don't know how to get on German Wikipedia or anything. I would love to see that. Yeah. Because I'm always trying, because when I do this, I'm like, our textbooks, because we're in Canada, obviously come from a very English-centric point of view. And if we're lucky, sometimes we get French. So I would love other countries. I would love indigenous, and I don't have any. Um, but other points of view that also are the same thing, essentially. So, yeah, that would be fantastic. See you in a couple of hours. You, uh, you can. I don't think so. What did the email say? I found out in my last class that nobody read the email. Mr. You, you know the weekly email that Mr. Rodriguez says? He said go to assembly in that. Yeah. Okay, there we go. And I'm just going to wait here and send people that way, and then I'll join you. Hold it. Is this, it doesn't start right away. You guys have cookie break first? Yeah, okay. Tell any other grade 11s from other houses. A ton of them appeared not to know. Hello, good morning, good morning. Not too bad. I am done with all of this. Did. Very busy. The, um, I did not. I went to Victoria on Sunday. That it was very wet, uh, but um, because we haven't been able to do it. It feels like a long time, but really we just weren't able to do it last year. Um, but it was nice to be able to go in and see the students enjoying themselves. Oh my goodness. What does going to the States have to do with that? <laughs> okay, one second, because I have a couple things a couple things to warn you with, um, and that is, let's go in here. We have enough room, so obviously you can, and I'm not uh, I'm worried about anything of that. But just so you know, um, Chemistry 11 AP and Chemistry 11 are the same difficulty. So the only real difference is chemistry 11 AP goes faster. So sometimes when students drop down, they're expecting it to get cognitively um, easier, and it doesn't. On the other hand, it is slower, so you have more time to do it. So if it's a matter of time, then yes, it, it will be easier that way. Okay. Now, have you discussed it with him? <laughs> he will understand, and he will also try and talk you out of it. Uh, um, uh, so, but you, you said one thing because you're not going to the states. AP counts as a credit in university, and most people take it not necessarily for the credit, but to help them in university here because it makes it easier. Like if you take calculus here, even if you take calculus in university, now you've done half of it, so it's way easier. Um, you're not planning to go into chemistry?
sure. Uh, that sounds good. Now, have, you, have you discussed this with the counseling office? Oh, okay. Okay. Do all those things. Sure. Okay. What, do you know what, what block are you in there? E. So this block. Okay. So if you ended up transferring, just so you know, you have a quiz on Wednesday. <laughs> what have you been doing in that class? Uh, have you done like matter and definitions? Ah. You'll catch up. It'll be fine. Um, but so, yeah, talk about it. Look at university because uh, AP does does help, especially if you're going to take it in university as someone who, who got went into chemistry. Um, if you're going more of the medicine side, it really does help. I've had chem, biochem, double major. Understanding chemistry really helps the biochem. Um, because the stuff you struggle with in biochem is usually the chemistry because they don't teach it well. But if you have a chemistry background, it's so much easier. Pardon? Of course you have to do the quiz on Wednesday. Why not? Then, then at least you have a basis point. And you go like, oh, there's where you are. Do quizzes count later on if you're doing better? Not necessarily. Because a quiz is just checking out what you know. If you don't know it and you went back and restudied it and you did better in the future, then yeah, then, then it'll be fine. You'll, you know, you'll be fine. Um, everything we've done up until the end of last week. It's not very long. It's like ten multiple choice questions. It, it's it's not it's not intended to be difficult. Do you know the definition of an element? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a friend in this class or any of my regular chemistry eleven classes? Oh yeah, do not not a Hazel. Hazel's in the same boat. Anybody else in grade eleven you know? Okay. As long as you're in my class, all three classes are generally always going to be at the same spot. I have a live stream that you can go back and watch old classes. Uh, the live stream doesn't always work, but um, if it doesn't, then the other classes it would have, and it's because there's basically they're their own backup. Um, you can get notes off of any other student. Uh, just make sure there's someone and have a study buddy who's not in the same sport as you. Um, and then just I'm um, just really think about if I'm going to take this university with AP, because I don't I don't want you to s panic switch. If I was taking AP, I'd I'd be worried about panic switching. Like oh my god, this is going to be too hard, and I'm not going to have enough time. Are you in rowing or the musical or anything? Mm. So a lot of early mornings, competitive rowing. Oh okay, so no worries there. Okay. It entirely up to you. Your advisor knows you far better than I do. So those are all the warning things I would give to one of my advisees. Okay? You're welcome. Hmm.